warm welcome uh, to everybody uh, online. Um, uh, warm welcome uh, to everybody in Belgrade. Unfortunately, we're not there today, but we joined you online from many parts in Europe, I believe, and beyond. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be chairing this panel for you uh, this uh, this evening. Um, at least it's my evening. I'm, I'm stayed in The Hague, but of course we have a speaker all the way from South Korea, where actually I believe it's quite late already. Um, so thank you for joining. Uh, we will be discussing with all of you um, and this distinguished group of speakers in the next hour or so, a key question uh, that is, I think, on the mind of all of us today. Um, that is, will the COVID-19 pandemic reshape or accelerate history? Um, I'm honored to be the moderator uh, today, um, since we have five very distinguished uh, speakers with a long and diverse backgrounds in uh, both academia and in uh, government circles. So I assure you uh, from what I heard um, prior to this panel, um, they will be speaking about that they will inspire your thinking um, almost at the end of the day in Europe. Um, so we will be discussing uh, three key questions. Um, are we witnessing a change in the power dynamics of our world order? Um, and if so, in what way? Um, who should be the new leaders in the post-pandemic world? And did the pandemic um, bring more solidarity to mankind or are we seeing it falling apart? Um, each of their speakers will give their final, uh, will give their kickoff remarks in about five minutes. Um, and then I would like to open the floor for discussion and q and I believe that you can leave your, uh, your key questions uh, in the chat. Uh, please also leave your name and affiliation um, so that we can uh, have a better understanding of whom we are talking to. Um, without much further ado, um, I would like to uh, give the floor to our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Nicolas Zurinda. Um, now the president of the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies, but of course many of you will know him as the former Prime Minister of Slovakia. Um, I believe that your, one of your key points, uh, Mr. Turinda, is that uh, the pandemic proves that we need to uh, think globally but act locally. Um, will you please explain to us why and what this means for the EU and its member states? Yes, thank you very much, Madam, for being introduced. And at the beginning, I'd like to thank also the Belgrade Security Forum uh, organizers for being invited. Uh, look, uh, it, is, uh, it is clear by my mind that the pandemic is changing some paradigms on one side, but also underlines, uh, underline uh, the validity of the others on the other side. So uh, let me briefly mention what is new and uh, what remains old or unchanged. What is new? I am going to mention three elements. The first is a knowledge that we all are very vulnerable. Uh, being uh, small or big, uh, being rich or poor, being old or young, a reality demonstrates, for, for example, that even small countries or poorer countries can become champions if they manage things responsibly. This is the first, I would say, uh, sign of changes coming from uh, pandemic reality. The second is um, the fact that we, we recognize a fundamental shift on our labor market. Until now, uh, we used to look for a job wherever possible. Where was a job? We were able and willing to travel for work, even to change our residence and work a field. The basic paradigm of my time was very, very simple. You have to go for a job. A job will now go for you. Uh, or at, at, at best, the governments provided big corporations with different incentives, such as uh, tax holidays or subsidies on a working place, what I did in my time, by the way. Now we have to change this paradigm. We need to get jobs to our households. Politics has to help people so that they are able to work from home and to create new jobs, not only to preserve existing ones. This is a big reality. This is a, a substantial change. 
And number three is the awareness that the West needs to reduce or decrease its dependence on China. For instance, in pharmaceutical industry, but especially in technologies in general, but when it comes to 5G network in particular. So these three elements this, this, describing very briefly what is new and what remains old or unchanged. Again, three elements. The first, global rivalry. There is no doubt that China is struggling for hegemony and global dominance, and the US is slowly but surely withdrawing from the global political scene, redirecting the emphasis from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The second, this is inability or unwillingness of Europe to become a global power or equivalent, really reliable ally to the United States. The rhetoric has been changed positively, positively to some extent, but delivery is lagging behind. I, am, I mean uh, the strategic autonomy in foreign policy uh, and security, or I'm speaking or thinking about uh, the idea of the permanent structured cooperation in defense. And the third element is the fact that values-driven policy matters. The pandemic unveiled the ability of Germany to accept common European recovery bonds. Very big news, especially vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Italy. Solidarity remains one of the basic pillars of the EU, but also subsidiarity. And the pandemic is proving what you mentioned, Madam, at the beginning. We need to think globally, but to act locally in our regions, inside of our municipalities. Pandemic has, uh, has proved this very, very clearly. So at the end, uh, what, is the main lessons learned from the pandemic. I see two substantial conclusions. The first, we need structural reforms of our national economies, economies based on digitalization, automation, robotization, and artificial intelligence. For that reason, we need to build an effective and relevant infrastructure. And the second, we need to shape the EU to become a relevant, equally strong, and reliable ally to the United States. Transatlantic alliance has no alternative. And the key to its future lies in our European hands. If you ask who should lead the world, this is my deep conviction that it should be a strong cooperation, partnership, alliance between the EU and the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zurinda, for, um, for raising many interesting points and for sticking to time, I should add. Um, I think there will be many, uh, many of the issues you addressed we will be discussing uh, in, in the time to come. Um, what you say about the transatlantic relationship uh, is, of course, a, a, a very clear stance. Not everybody in Europe is so willing to, uh, to be so clear. Um, so I would love to discuss that in, uh, in a bit more detail, but let's first give the floor uh, to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Bruno Massaez, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, and of course, former Europe minister in Portugal. Um, I think he will actually follow on to one of the things that, uh, that we just heard about, um, uh, about the role of the, um, the fact that we need to reshape our economies. Um, I believe, Mr. Masai, is that your point, uh, one of your key points is that um, the pandemic will remain remembered as an academic, economic revolution. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yes, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great honor to speak after uh, Nicolas, who, who is in fact uh, my boss at the, at the Martin Center, uh, where I'm also a fellow. Um, I, it was interesting to, to, to listen to Nicholas and see that, uh, in fact, he already pointed out that we are going to have to change a number of things about how our economies work. And I think that's fundamentally rooted in a number of facts that COVID made clear. First of all, it made clear how acute global competition is, geopolitical competition. It was a shock for many people in Europe, not for all, but for many people in Europe, 
to see Chinese diplomats um, use the pandemic as a way to affirm the success of their response as against the uh, efforts made by European governments. Uh, and that's uh, all on the record and on Twitter. So we were awakened to the intensity of global competition. And we were awakened to a fact that many had pointed out before, that there's uh, some uh, vulnerabilities uh, in the way the global economy was organized. Uh, the way we had invested everything on just-in-time supply chains, uh, neglecting the possibility that in many cases these supply chains could be disrupted or could stop working. That, I think, was also a wake-up moment back in February and March. Now, the question for me is, uh, is this really a momentary uh, phenomenon? Uh, will it go away when we have a good vaccine? Uh, and I think more and more people are getting convinced that it's really a moment of fundamental change. First of all, because as the experts warn us, the vaccine is not going to be a deus ex machina that solves everything overnight. It's going to be a difficult, long process of deploying the vaccine worldwide, sometimes in the face of popular resistance, unfortunately. And second, I think we're starting to think that perhaps after COVID, uh, we will see uh, the same set of consequences uh, being visible as a result of climate change. What we saw with COVID uh, can very well be replicated as, as an outcome of climate change. So today we're discussing the vulnerability of supply chains in uh, medical supplies uh, or some technological areas. Tomorrow, we'll be discussing the vulnerability of supply chains when it comes to food supply. After all, if a port is flooded uh, somewhere uh, along the, the routes that bring uh, our food uh, and our agricultural supplies to Europe, uh, that uh, will be a problem. And it's better to prepare for that before it happens. Uh, some parts of the world may suffer disruptions as a result of fires, floods, or climate change as a whole. So we're starting to think about the ways to face this problem. Uh, I don't believe it's going to be a complete retreat from globalization, but perhaps to some extent, many sectors will come to resemble what is the energy sector today. The energy sector is globalized, but uh, it always forces us to uh, find a balance between two competing aims. On the one hand, efficiency. On the other hand, security. And the way you pursue security in the energy sector is, in many cases, through strategic reserves, in other cases, through active uh, uh, foreign economic policy, trying to diversify access to uh, energy supplies. Uh, and I think we're going to have to apply the same logic to other sectors that we didn't consider in the past. Uh, this is on the, on the global scene. Very quickly, just uh, one minute, uh, I think we're going to see similar phenomena when it comes to domestic politics. One thing that I think that the, the pandemic has done is to make people aware of the possibilities of politics and of collective power. Uh, this is not said often, but uh, the response to the pandemic was an extraordinary success uh, and a global success. Uh, how many lives have we saved? Uh, and in fact, uh, it's difficult to think of a country that simply washed its hands of the humanitarian impact of the pandemic. Uh, every country was trying in its own way uh, to reduce the death toll and the human cost, uh, and in many cases with remarkable success. And even the, the, the cases that we like to criticize, again, compared to what would have been the result if governments had done nothing. Uh, and so it awakened us to the possibilities of collective political power. And I think uh, this uh, will be uh, translated into other areas. I'll, I'll give just one example. Uh, many times we have become used to the argument that it, that it was not possible to do anything about the homelessness problem in many European cities. Well, it turned out that in February and March, when it became a question of public health, many cities were able to respond quickly and to address that problem. Now, citizens are asking, if it's possible to do a number of these things during a pandemic, why not do uh, the very same things, which are socially valuable in normal times or after the pandemic is over? So I think we're going to see a moment when uh, certainly some dimensions of state power are going to return. Uh, for, for me, as, as for Michael, as I believe, uh, the challenge is how are we going to manage that transition in a way that guarantees economic efficiency and, and the freedoms of citizens um, and, and that we don't jeopardize that because uh, I believe uh, whether we like it or not, we are entering revolutionary times.
Indeed, revolutionary times. Um, that would be an understatement even. Thank you so much for uh, for that very uh, broad perspective. Uh, also on the, the domestic uh, consequences and um, approaches taken by different governments in these times. Um, highlighting also the interlinkages between the, the public health and, and other sectors. Um, and I wonder even about climate change. Would love to hear your thoughts on that, um, how uh, perhaps uh, this, this pandemic can also reinvigorate or will it make it more complicated uh, to, for us to deal with uh, those issues? Um, for now, uh, let's move to our third speaker. Uh, we'll have a plenary discussion uh, later. Our third speaker is, um, of course, from Spain, uh, Mr. Manuel Muniz, uh, recently appointed Secretary of State for Global Spain at the Spanish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation, I believe you call it. Um, formerly also uh, Dean of the School of Global and Public Affairs at IE University. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all, and thank you to the uh, to the forum for inviting me uh, another year to a to a discussion uh, on a very uh, relevant uh, relevant topic. So, let me let me just delve right in. I want to stick uh, very much to the time that I was given on the consequences of COVID for global affairs, and um, basically we've concluded over here. One of the preliminary conclusions of the impact of this crisis on global issues is that. It functions fundamentally as a big accelerator uh, of prior trends. It changes, it changes some dynamics, but on the on the on the fundamental issues, uh, we think that it serves as a as an accelerator. And I'm gonna I'm gonna focus exclusively on one topic that has been of concern to us, and and that is the growing uh, social and economic fracture within our countries and its political consequences and it, the political economy. Of, of those processes of social fracture that we had been experiencing. And the reason why I think it's relevant to focus on this is because if you try to draw uh, the, the fundamental trend in global politics of the last uh, decade or two, uh, probably you would conclude that that trend is one of weakening of the international architecture, a questioning of multilateralism on a number of fronts, uh, you know, it's been termed the weakening of the international liberal order uh, by a number of uh, scholars and analysts over the past few years, and a generalized regression of freedoms and liberties even within Western countries. So there's been, you know, growth uh, a, on the of the attacks on the rights and freedoms of minorities and a questioning of democracy as a form of government, even within very established uh, democracy. So if that was the trend, uh, and maybe some folks on the panel don't agree with this diagnosis, but if I look at the world and I look at the concert of international politics of the last 10 to 20 years, you see these, these dissonant notes uh, in the concert of global politics, but when you add them all together, that's roughly the symphony that this draws. So the world was headed in this direction before the pandemic hit. So, so I think it's a very legitimate question to ask, you know, what would the pandemic, what will it do to these trends? And, and as I was saying, on a very preliminary analysis, it at, at the very least, it exposes us to the threat of an acceleration of these trends. And I'm going to mention two examples uh, where, where this could be the case. One is on the uh, economic impact of the pandemic. So we know that it has an unequal economic impact, particularly severe on uh, precarious employment. So about three quarters of the employment that was displaced uh, because of the crisis in Spain was uh, short term employment or low pay employment. A, a, a chunk of it has already been recovered because our uh, sort of for, uh, furlough uh, employment furlough schemes that we've uh, put in place. But it, it clearly the initial impact was very concentrated on that type of employment. Um, we also know that this hits harder uh, single parent households that you know the digital divide that this crisis is deepening because a lot of our education is moving to the digital space uh the digital divide is now you know is now feeding into the educational divide because uh children in low income households that have little access to digital technologies are actually falling behind on their studies uh, we know that collectives and groups of our population that are in depopulated areas and with lack of access to public health care and others are more severely affected so just on a very preliminary analysis, it seems to, to deepen these trends of social fracture. Now, why this is relevant, I only have a couple of minutes left, so it's, it's a very complex topic, but I'm, I'm going to try to 
summarize it in one phrase, uh, you know, and this is sort of the findings of the of the of the last few years of research is this this hollowing out of our middle class, this this growing precariousness of the middle of our income distribution in the West is producing a hollowing out of the middle of our political spectrum. So the, these two trends uh, are interrelated, they're correlated, uh, and it's that hollowing out of the middle and the rise of polarization within our politics that is leading to a convulsion in the international political arena because these new uh, populist nationalist movements within uh, many of the Western uh, world countries are leading to this revision of the international architecture that I was mentioning before. Um, so, so the fact that the crisis can deepen that, uh, I think, means that it's an accelerator of the other process of erosion of the international architecture. Now, the other way in which the crisis can have an impact on these processes, uh, and I'm going to have to cover this fairly quickly, is on the disinformation front. So just to give you an idea, the European uh, Union the External Action Service in Brussels estimates that uh, from 2015 to today, there have been roughly 8,000 disinformation campaigns. So these are well-designed uh, and assessed uh, campaigns that have particular messages. Most of these campaigns targeted the legitimacy of EU institutions, uh, the capacity of liberal governments to deal with uh, liberal societies, to deal with the challenges of the 21st century, etc. Well, out of those 8,000, a quarter of those campaigns were COVID-related. So in the space of two, three months, we had a quarter's worth of the disinformation of the last five years. So there's something in this pandemic that's a real boon uh, to disinformation. It just lends itself to these campaigns of the de delegitimization of our institutions on our, on our form of government. Um, so this feeds into the erosion of trust in institutions, which is another uh, dimension of that collapse that I was mentioning before, because the hollowing out of the center of our political spectrum is also manifested in the lack of, in the erosion of institutional trust uh, and of trust in political, economic, and intellectual elites. So the fact that the disinformation campaigns are more numerous, uh, it al also means that that process of loss of institutional trust is uh, accelerated. Uh, so just on those two very fronts, uh, the crisis, uh, the crisis has an impact. So. My conclusion would be we have to be very careful on the exit to the strategy. We need to make sure that nobody's left behind. We need to make sure that the inclusion dimension of our exit uh, plans, not just the digitalization and the circular economy and sustainability agendas are there, but also the inclusion agenda is there so that we don't fall into the same mistakes that we made in 2008 and 2009. I think that's absolutely essential if we want for the larger challenge that we've been facing for the last decade which is this collapse, erosion, and slow collapse of the international architecture uh, continues. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Muniz, for uh, another set of very important questions. Um, the domestic uh, effects, of course, of, of COVID, um, as everybody turns to digital tools, what does that mean? Um, and perhaps our way of regulating those tools, um, I wonder, might be a, a solution to some of the issues that you mentioned. Uh, we'll get to that, I'm sure, in our second round. Um, for now, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Valérie Nike. She is uh, head of the Asia Department at uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique, and uh, I think a Paris-based think tank, um, and at the same time, a joint senior fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs, based in Tokyo. Um, I think she will uh, share with her us her views on how the world is not rushing into a China-led order. Um, and I'm very curious to hear her argument with that. Thank you. I think your um, uh, microphone still muted. Could you unmute yourself? Sorry, I'm, uh, I forgot to switch on my mic. So now here we are. Uh, actually, I would like to focus on Permanencies. Uh, maybe this is a paradox and counterintuitive, but I will take two examples. One in Asia. Uh, of course, I'm a specialist of Asia and the role of China, so I will focus more on this. But I would like also to add one thing directly related to my country, France, where, of course, as in many other countries in Europe, we see 
what is called a second wave of the COVID-19 uh, challenges to government, the economy, as was already mentioned, and governance capabilities and the rise of populism. All this is related to the COVID-19. But in spite of this very pressing crisis, uh, health crisis, economic crisis, just recently, uh, uh, a new terror attack that happened in France against a teacher who was uh, decapitated only a few days ago uh, reminds us that in spite of the COVID-19, other extremely pressing strategic affairs issues are also challenging our leadership and must be tackled at the same time. And this is a huge challenge for all government. This is not only health or plus uh, the economy. This is also other challenges that did not disappear because of the COVID-19, in spite of the fact that many of us just put these things a little bit behind, but they are still there, and they are still very pressing, important issues. Uh, the second uh, point is, of course, more related to my field of uh, specialty, which is in Asia. And here again, what is fascinating is that, of course, COVID-19 started in Asia, uh, more specifically from China, for specific reasons. I will not com come back to that now. Uh, but uh, in spite of the importance of the uh, health issue in, uh, in Asia and consequences, economic consequences of, it, of this COVID-19 COVID pandemics, China is maybe getting a little bit better, but other countries uh, in the region are suffering from the crisis, especially in Southeast Asia, Japan too. But in spite of that, we see that strategic challenges and security challenges are on the rise, and they are still very much there. And you cannot just focus on the COVID-19 uh, issues in the region, but uh, you, the, the countries in the region also have very much to focus on broader strategic and security affairs. And we saw that translation into uh, a few, first, the, why? The reason, main reason is, of course, the fact that in spite of the COVID-19 pandemics, China chose to have a much more um, some would say aggressive or assertive uh, foreign policy, maybe in relation with uncertainties at home, and choose the COVID-19 crisis, at, at least uh, at the same time of the COVID-19 crisis, China decided to apply a much stricter co control, for instance, over Hong Kong. The Xinjiang issue, of course, did not disappear. But not only that, you have uh, more activities, naval maritime activities in the South China Sea and also in the South East China Sea and also around Taiwan and in the Taiwan Strait. So you see that uh, at the same time that there is this health issue, global issue of the pandemics, the countries of the region are directly confronted with very basic security and strategic issues that they, they have to deal with. At the same time, you have, and I will finish here because I think I am uh, at the end of my five minutes. At the same time, also the other big uncertainties is, of course, the result of the coming elections in the United States uh, with a lot of questions and interrogations about what would be the policy of course, of the new Democrat or Joe Biden presidency, eventually in Asia, even though there is a kind of consensus now in the United States. But also, if uh, the president, President Trump, is re-elected, we are not sure at all that he will not go back to his ideas of uh, building deals with uh, countries like China or North Korea. So, for all the countries in the region, in the Asia Pacific, the COVID-19 is a big changer, game changer. But also, you have all these underlying going on trends that did not disappear and that have to be dealt with in spite of this uh, crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's indeed, I think, uh, getting back to some of the, the points that Bruno uh, was also making on um, how the COVID crisis is accelerating uh, existing trends. Um, and the vulnerabilities of supply chains, of course, you didn't mention, but uh, they would also feature into how uh, Asian governments are dealing with this. 
Um, indeed, it seems uh, beyond the wolf warrior diplomacy in Europe that uh, the Chinese government is not wasting this crisis uh, in, the re in its own region um, either. Um, so, since we're talking about Asia, um, let's turn to there. Um, from Seoul, of course, we have um, Professor Yong Suk Yang, um, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at Sung Kyung Kwang University in Seoul, um, with a perspective um, from South Korea. Thank you. Uh, I'm very exci excited to be a part of this panel, and thank you for the invitation. So, my introductory remark is not going to talk about the Korea much, but going to talk about the, the world order in general. So, the COVID-19 pandemic is the first global level crisis in human history that affected all the people in the old countries. The COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health crisis, but also it has caused the economic and social disruption in many aspects. The negative socioeconomic effects of the COVID-19 accompany with the resurgence of the nationalist politics and state border closure and restrictions. Facing such devastating consequences at the global level, however, the international community has not shown coordinated responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, during this pandemic, the United States, the world's greatest power, has shown relatively incompetent policy responses and disrespect international partnership rather than seeking for it. This relatively poor performance of the United States during this pandemic has tarnished its reputation and thereby its soft power. However, I believe that it is hard to say that COVID-19 is really changing the world order. In other words, Despite this broad, uh, broad implication on international politics in general, COVID-19 has not shifted the distribution of power in the international system much. The United States is still the world's strongest country whose hard power remains matchless. At the same time, China, the second greatest power, arguably, have not used this window of the crisis to take a leading role in the pandemic world. Rather, China's reputation has plunged during the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, according to a recent survey conducted by Pew Research in 14 countries between June and August, unfavorable views of, of China has sharply risen in all of these countries, and Beijing's reputation was at its lowest point on record in most countries. The sharp increase in negative views of China's reputation is mainly due to criticism for its initial handling of the pandemic. Though China has done pretty good jobs in containing the outbreak since then and in, in bouncing back its economy in recent months. While the world order has not shifted much yet, it is notable that U.S.-China rivals intensified at a faster speed in recent months. Trump administration has blamed China for the almost like the all the problems incurred by COVID-19 and recently has launched the sanction for the champion Huawei. In response, China has used the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, threatening other countries with retaliation, mostly through export control measures. In this regard, we could say COVID-19 is accelerating the clash of two great powers while that moment has not yet come. Then what should countries do to stop the current pandemic and developing international institutions to prevent the future ones? It is evident that United States, China, and other nations should be working together and make a coordinated effort. Nevertheless, it will be a daunting task as it has been. The rise of nationalism and protectionism, as well as competition for the vaccine between the countries, which is so-called biotech arms race, have hampered it. Still, we may have a chance. One possibility is that the coming presidential election in the United States could be an inflection point. Though it is still expected that the U.S.-China rivalry would prevail in the near future, the new president in the U.S. could change a course of policy action and try to take a leading role to combat with the pandemic by relying on the cooperation with other countries and international organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another very clear call for um, the need for more cooperation. 
Um, perhaps uh, you could uh, kickstart uh, also the discussion that we're moving into. So I do welcome anybody who has questions, um, uh, do uh, put them in the chat. Um, but perhaps following up on, on what you just said, Professor Young, um, what do you think, what key steps should be taken to actually achieve that sort of cooperation that you're calling for? Oh, so basically, like that, so, okay, to my knowledge, like in order to like achieve those international level cooperation, countries need a leader. So countries are leader who can bear some like the cost or who can like the take a leading role to like the make the international organization or the in institutional institution shaped in a way that we can deal the better deal with this kind of like the crisis. But at this moment, like the, there is a perfume of leader in international community as the United States like the just like the, uh, the moved back away from the those kind of international involvement. So that's why like, I think that like, the one possibility to change like this game is, you know, depends on like the who gonna win the like the coming presidency election in the United States. So yeah, but other than that, like the as the uh, as the like the the Mr. Jorinda like the mentioned, the, this kind of like the norm change, like if my understanding is correct, those kind of norm change can be also like, a very great asset to like to achieve those kind of international cooperation. Indeed. Um, so if you say that we have to wait a few weeks before we know who's going to be in the White House <laughs> and whether we can expect that sort of leadership. Um, perhaps, indeed, uh, we can get back to the EU. Um, uh, Mr. Zrinda, you called for more uh, uh, for the EU to take a stronger stance together, uh, to be a, become a real global leader. Do we have the, uh, the leaders, actually, who can make that happen? Or what else do you think are key steps to be taken? My mind is a fundamental one. On one side, there is no doubt that uh, the current German uh, chancellor is a fantastic leader. Uh, and I am glad that uh, in these days, Germany hosts the EU presidency, but the cha we face a number of huge challenges, so rule of law, quality of the rule of law, also in some EU member states, a new uh, budget for 21-27. Uh, or conditionality between the rule of law and, and money uh, spending and many, many others, security. But uh, uh, what should be done in the near future, by my mind, to become really a strong and reliable global player? We need to change our decision making, especially in areas which by nature belong to the communitarian or federal level, especially when it comes to foreign policy, security, defense, certain elements of illegal immigration, and maybe also the question of the budget. Making long story short, I strongly believe that we need to change unanimity in these areas and to decide by qualified majority. There are many examples that the current state of play uh, doesn't work. Look at Belarus. Look how difficult it is to look for a consensus when it comes to so crystally clear issues um, as uh, democracy or totalitarian regime in Belarus. Uh, consensus uh, is banning us for adoption, very important and timely measures. So my humble recommendation for the uh, upcoming uh, month or years is to change the decision making, to decide in time and to decide effectively, especially in those substantial areas, foreign policy, security, defense, immigration and budget. Let's turn to Mr. Muniz. He's now in the middle of all of this. Do you see that happening? Or do you agree that this is a key ingredient for success? Uh, one of the best news, probably one of the few positive, really truly positive news 
that we've had over the past uh, few months have, has been the European response in general to the crisis. So, and I and there are two areas where this has been vital, right? So one has been on the on the monetary front, and I I think we discuss this too little uh, normally because uh, you know this was central in two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, and we had a big big uh, discussion over whether the EU should be active on that front, but. This has made this response has now meant that the the health crisis did not become a sovereign wealth crisis. And I can tell you, I'm on the phone and I'm on video conferences constantly with folks in governments that have uh, public funding issues that have real constraints. And these are these are countries outside the EU and that that are not being able to implement programs like we have in Europe. So just to give you an example, Spain has now uh, passed and, and implemented s stimulus programs for the economy that are worth upwards of 20% of our GDP, right? And to a large extent, that is a consequence of EU action on the monetary front. And the second front has been on the budgetary front. So the, the EU, the next generation fund uh, is of such a scale and offers such an opportunity to address the challenges brought by this. That is, uh, I think, a huge milestone in the EU integration process. I know it's meant to be a you know a, a one uh, you know sort of one shot kind of thing, uh, but the reality is that we've decided to act collectively to be able to address this moving forward. Uh, and I think those are real signs of leadership on the part of the EU. And I think we would be living in a very different world had the EU not responded in this way. And I think that would have reflected in the EU standing um, globally when it came to the management of the crisis. So I'm, I, when, when, we're, when we're talking about the, the role of Europe in all of this, I, I have to say that the reading that we have from this part of the world is extremely positive. And having been involved uh, in the crafting of some of these uh, agreements, uh, I have to say that... Uh, it has been an extraordinary effort that has placed the EU. I think it has guaranteed that the EU integration process will move forward uh, rather than backwards and that the citizens will perceive that the union was up to the task when it came to managing a very complicated problem. Thank you. I think that's very important to highlight all the, the crucial steps that uh, have been taken in the past few months in, in Brussels uh, with the member states um, that, that sometimes gets overlooked. So I really appreciate you emphasizing that. Um, I, I have a question here from uh, one of the our viewers online. Um, to Mr. Zurinda uh, specifically, but I think uh, perhaps if anybody else feels um, that they should uh, want to take this one, uh, I encourage you to raise your hand. Um, during the initial outbreak of the pandemics in the Western Balkans, we could hear statements uh, that European solidarity is dead and that other actors like China uh, are the only one that could help Western Balkan countries, is what this uh, person says. So the question is, do you see statements like that harmful for the region, uh, for Europe and potentially for the overall international institutional architecture? Would you like to take that question, uh, Mr. Zurinda? Yes, I'd like, but uh, I missed the meaning of the question. The signal reception is not the best. W what statement do you speak about? Um, well, it's basically um, the, the point that solidarity amongst Europeans uh, supposedly would be dead um, and that other actors like China are, are stepping in the void in the Western Balkan uh, region. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I don't think so that uh, solidarity in the EU is dead. I argued at the beginning, uh, as a part of my introductory remarks, that this is great that for the first time in our history, we've decided about uh, about uh, recovery bonds, common recovery bond, even though we are not using this expression. But this is fantastic that Germany at the end of the day and the frugals the group of four have accepted this. This is very, very clear expression of solidarity. Also, when uh, we speak about the budget, the, the multi-annual financial framework for 2021, 2027, there is a huge space for uh, cohesion and in in inclusiveness. China, China is playing a very old and classical game, divide et impera divide and rule. 
and it is clear in, in the Balkans, this is clear in the, in, in the Central Europe. I remember the case of the port of Piraeus in Greece. They invest, but at the end of the day, they try to influence political decision making. This is not about the solidarity from the Chinese side. This is about their intention to, to become number one in the world. This is, this is about Chinese hegemony and the dominance. Yeah, the, 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 the intention is legitimate, but the tools are from time to time pro problematic. So making long story short, I strongly believe that solidarity will play a substantial role inside the EU, but also uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, also, when it comes to the Western Balkans, which is trying to join us in the EU sooner or later. Thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a very clear answer. Um, I have another question uh, specifically addressed to uh, Mr. Makas or Ms. Niket. Um, if I'll read it out. Uh, we've seen in, that international organizations like the World Health Organization got influenced by China um, and the USA, on the other hand. Um, and uh, that the USA has stepped back uh, and openly delegitimized uh, the work of this organization. Um, which of the two is more harmful, uh, the fact that China is stepping in or the, the fact that uh, the, the Chinese influence is growing or the fact that the U United States is delegitimizing this organization? Any thoughts on that? Uh, just very quickly be, be, before uh, giving the, uh, back the floor to other speakers, I think that as was mentioned earlier, what is fascinating is that in spite of the increasing, increased control that China has on many uh, multilateral organizations, on its own very specific definition of multilateralism, which is at the service of China's or the PRC or the CCP's interest or not at all at the service of a true multilateralism, the image of China has been uh, degrading a lot uh, in recent months, uh, even before in Europe. One must not forget that the new uh, China strategy uh, was published in 20, 2016, and already before the COVID-19, EU started to change its, post its posture and position regarding China, evolving from a, a source of almost a, a complete source of opportunities to a source of both opportunities, but also challenges and even threats. So uh, I think that, as was said before, uh, China is maybe outwardly controlling a lot of multilateral organizations, but because of that uh, um, control that China is trying to exert, not always very in a subtle way, uh, the consequences are very much in negative for China itself. And the backlash and the consequences of the backlash against China, including on many issues like Belt and Road and even the 17 plus one, even though China is playing a role, but we see that there are some dissensions appearing, which was not the case before. And there is also a disappointment because of course, China may be, in spite of its uh, considerable uh, economic successes, uh, its capabilities are not absolutely without limits and um, China has to refocus on so on its own social issues, uh, development issues, and uh, maybe will not have money enough to, to give to many countries, but the only part of China's real soft power is actually, was actually its capability to invest and to pour money in some government. If, if, the, if, if the regime cannot do that anymore or in in such large uh, proportion as they did before, they will lose even more importantly uh, their capacity to influence uh, decision making in in many parts of the world, uh, not only in Europe. Thank you for that. Indeed, I think um, this is probably also getting back to um, uh, the point that was made before about uh, COVID as an accelerator of trends, uh, including the trend that awareness of China's growing role and presence in the EU and in international institutions is growing. And of course, with that, 
the need perceived by many countries to act on that. Um, Bruno Macaes, you, would, would you like to uh, comment on this um, beyond what's been said? Um, well, I, I wrote a whole book arguing that China is more interested in questions of economic power and economic expansion than in questions of soft power. So I'm not surprised that uh, Chinese diplomacy has turned out to be quite uh, clumsy when it comes to soft power. And what I would uh, argue, particularly uh, in, in Brussels, is that um, Europeans have to be cautious because it's not clear that soft power is the dominant dimension in global affairs. And we see that China is certainly getting ready to take advantage of the crisis to extend its economic position in many places. And every week we see news of that. Uh, we see, for example, how the Chinese COVID vaccine is being adopted by almost every country in Southeast Asia, with the exception of the Philippines and of Vietnam but Indonesia just signed a contract. Uh, we see how China is taking up positions in uh, many sectors, uh, taking advantage of depressed prices as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, and that debate is gonna be very important in Europe. Uh, Europe certainly has to have a deep reflection about the rules of the game and the extent to which we are still going to keep our economy open uh, even when our economy is open to the outside, even when some of the dominant actors are not uh, uh, following uh, rules of the market or the rules that we adopt uh, within the single market. So that's certainly a question that has to be debated in Europe, uh, and I would not get fixated on public opinion polls. I suspect that the Chinese authorities in Beijing would argue that public opinion polls are not where global power is decided. Okay. Thank you. Um, and following up on one of the points that you made in your uh, kickoff remarks um, about uh, balancing security and efficiency in a different way, as we, um, uh, as we, the well, European countries um, are, are reconsidering globalization. Um, should that be a focus, do you think, on on reshoring back to Europe, or should it be a diversification that might involve uh, moving away from China? Um, and turning again, uh, turning towards uh, a closer partnership uh, again uh, with uh, the United States, as Mrs. Rinda was uh, um, calling for. That partnership would have to be, uh, let us say, redeveloped anew. Uh, some of the institutions were developed for a very specific historical context in the Cold War. Uh, there's no reason, for example, why, uh, and I've, I've discussed this with Mikulos in, in Sweden, I remember, uh, there's no reason why uh, the United States and Europe could not develop a new kind of economic partnership uh, focused on developing new key technologies for the future. This, by the way, would not only be good in terms of reinforcing our common power, but it would also give an impetus to technological development, which I think now is a necessity, not only in Europe, but in, in the United States as well, which, where we see some signs of of stagnation and of, of political conflict between uh, Silicon Valley and, and Washington DC or, or the media culture in New York. Uh, so that's, I think, where, where we should focus, not just rest on the achievements of the past, uh, but rebuild the alliance anew and very much focus on these geoeconomic questions, which seem to me the most important questions of the next uh, two decades. Okay, thank you for that. Um, with an eye on the time, I think um, I would like to use the last five minutes that we have uh, for each of you to perhaps uh, share some some thoughts that came to your mind as you listened to your uh, fellow uh, speakers um, and reconsidered uh, perhaps your own thinking based on some of the questions that we discussed. Um, and I would like to go um, in reverse order, perhaps, uh, first by giving the floor to Professor Young. So thank you so much for like the uh, letting me know like a lot of like the things related to like the, this uh, this kind of uh, the, the the current pandemic. So like the one thing like the that caught my uh, my uh, my eyes and my ears was that the the point about the the relationship between the other sectors and public health. So which I think that the the yeah Bruno Mackay the Mr Mackay is like the mention. 
So I think that this is really important. Uh, important like the uh, the perspective, especially like the uh, it actually reminds me of that the like the very first like the police action taken by South Korea after like the we like the after the like the uh, I think the Wall Street Journal like the mentioned that the Korea has been like very successful in containing the, the pandemic was that the, the very first police action uh, taken by the South Korean government was to push for the Green New Deal. So basically the success of this kind of like the quarantine, like the cases or the like containing pandemic cases, I mean, using that, like the, that opportunity, the South Korean government like to put, I mean, push this kind of the idea of like the transforming like the economic, like the in the economic like sector and energy sector into like the more renewable, the renewable friendly, uh, friendly sector. So I think like, that there should be like, the, so I, the, the point that I wanted to like to mention is that like the, this kind of a crisis can be used by government to push for like the, some other sectors like development or the reform. So I think like the, those kind of like the relationship between this kind of crisis in public health and the other sector and the other sector reform or something like that will be really like the important thing that we have to uh, like to keep uh, keep looking at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So that's innovating ourselves out of the crisis by linking, breaking the silos between the, some of the, the sectors that are involved here. Thank you for that important reflection. Um, Valerie Nikiev, would you like to say uh, your, share your final thoughts? No, no, no ju just a very, very short remark, but I think that one of the good results in brackets of that pandemic is that, as was mentioned before, uh, discussions at the EU level between uh, member states and at the EU level on many issues, including strategic issues, actually increased uh, after the pandemic uh, rather than uh, decreased. And uh, uh, there is a focus on important issues like globalization, the role of China that is extremely important. And what I would like to focus is, of course, a necessity to improve also the dialogue not only with our Indo-Pacific partners, but also the transatlantic dialogue, and I think it's a major issue, not only focusing on security, but on more, on more global issues too. Indeed. Um, so the good coming out of Brussels should also continue uh, after the US election. Um, and with the Indo-Pacific, indeed, that's a new trend. Uh, very interesting indeed. Um, Mr. Manuel Muniz, you're... Uh, Final reflections? Yeah, no, just to just to reaffirm what was said before uh, that um, and just a, a quick comment on strategic autonomy, because I think that this is uh, going to be a very important lens to through which we can understand EU foreign policy moving forward. I, I think it's going to be very hard uh, for us to make sense of how we look at the world and how the EU tr conducts this. Uh, foreign policy and also it's re the revision of its trade policy without looking at strategic autonomy. So I would keep an eye out for that concept and for that um, and for that process uh, moving forward. And I think COVID is probably a, also a big accelerator of that. But a, a great pleasure to be on the panel with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Indeed, strategic autonomy is a word that we've heard a lot uh, in the in the past few months, also, and uh, surely. Uh, will be on our uh, agenda for discussion in, in the time ahead. Bruno Mackays? Uh, well, no, I think uh, I agree with the Secretary of State. Uh, uh, this is important and, and, and it's time to start uh, also producing uh, policy decisions and legislative uh, uh, texts on this. Uh, for a long time, I remember when I was in government, it's, it's now five years, we had been discussing the reciprocal public procurement instrument. Uh, and of course, China was very much the issue behind that discussion. Uh, it's been five years and we still don't have a decision on that. Um, we have to speed up the processes. Uh, we have to come up with better decision-making processes. But I, I agree with the, with the Secretary of State. It's, this should be the leading concept of uh, strategic autonomy. And a lot of work has been done, uh, uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical work about how to flesh out the concept. It's been a great pleasure to be on the panel and until another opportunity in Belgrade. Thank you so much, indeed. Um, then a final word uh, to Mikilas uh, Zurinda. 
<clears throat> there is a slogan which can which can sound as a cliche, but uh, I don't think so. That it is a cliche that every crisis represents an opportunity as well. I believe that it was present also in our discussion. We should use this opportunity to promote reforms, especially structuring reforms in our economies, but also reforms at the EU level to have equally strong EU, institu EU institutions, but also the, the member states. Well, I like this expression strategic autonomy, but uh, we need to materialize this. I try to interpret to interpret this on uh, our decision making. If we are able to take this opportunity and to promote reforms at the national level, but also at the EU level, we can achieve the situation when, when we are strong and respected. We need in Europe to be more respected than before. I am telling this uh, fully, be, uh, being fully ever that we have achieved a lot, also in the Central Europe. I am very grateful to that, but we cannot stop. The pandemic represents a real opportunity for the EU to mature and to be strong and su successful in the future. If we are courageous enough to promote necessary reforms. Thank you very much. I think that's a very powerful closing uh, of this uh, very inspiring panel. Um, I think the uh, organizers probably uh, consciously and uh, well thought through uh, made this decision to uh, to invite three very high level speakers that have been or are involved in uh, uh, EU and, and European politics. Um, they've sent clear messages, of course, on the EU's need to be a stronger actor on the global stage uh, and to to really operationalize, I think, um, the, the issue of strategic autonomy. Uh, from my own discussions with uh, American policymakers recently, I know that this is not always well understood or well received in other countries, so we need to be aware of that also. Uh, but of course, as we um, invest and innovate ourselves out of the crisis, um, I think many of the issues that were brought up today uh, will stimulate our thinking to achieve just that. So thank you uh, to all the panelists for your uh, excellent uh, introductions. And thank you for the Belgrade Security Forum for hosting such an inspiring panel. I wish you all a very good uh, evening or night, um, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you for watching the online panel of the 10th Belgrade Security Forum. We will be back soon.